Well, good morning. God's peace to you this morning. Pray that you're blessed here today. I do want to just echo what Randy said about continuing in prayer for Candy. Um, it's pretty, pretty uh, gloomy Tuesday, and your prayers have uh, meant a lot to Brian and and the family. And I know that they're effective in uh, bringing the Lord's power and grace uh, into the situation. So please stay faithful in praying for her. Um, I think I also saw uh, Sawyer and Amber walk in with their new baby. They might be upstairs. Yeah, Uh, it's the first time, so leave them alone. Give them some space, okay? (laughs) But we're glad to to see that wonderful blessing um, among us. All right, so this morning we are going to talk about the wonderful love of God. At uh, Advent season, Christmas time, uh, very often this is a theme that people think about and and pray about and uh, find cause to worship God because of his gifts. We're so often focused on gift giving this time of year and Sometimes we're more focused on gift receiving, but uh, we do understand the idea of a gift uh, in that rudimentary sense of blessing someone, giving them something that will bring joys. We've been singing about as well today. And you know what it's like to have a gift uh, from someone who knows you and cares about you and, and has thoughtfully given you a gift. Um, It's a blessing. It's a wonderful thing. And it brings joy to the heart. As we look at what God's love inspired him to do in giving his son to us um, to provide for our needs in a way that really we could never provide for ourselves, we see something that not only causes joy but is awe-inspiring. In fact, my message to you this morning is this. The world, and certainly none of us here today, would understand what true love is without the gift of God's Son. The world has lots of definitions for love. You can go watch a rom-com and get a certain definition of love. You can talk to an inspiring figure, character, and and their passion for what they do, their work or their artistry, and you can get a definition for love. You can look in the world of of hedonism and pleasure-seeking and get a definition of love. In Jesus' day, love involved all those things. C.S. Lewis has this amazing little book called The Four Loves, where he looks at the Greek world and the Greek language and how the idea of love was communicated. And the Greek world, the world that Jesus uh, uh, lived in, was one that elevated all kinds of forms of love except for one, agape love. We sometimes uh, think because of our Christianization that, that agape love is, is the highest form of love, and it is, but in Jesus' day, it was considered the lowest form of love. It's the kind of love you would have for somebody that was pathetic. Oh, well, I'll just, you know, do them a favor, that kind of thing. And Jesus says, no, that's the highest kind of love. When you will the good of someone else, when what you do is dependent on what you believe will be in the best interests of someone else and not yourself, even to the point of sacrifice, that was mind-blowing, world-altering idea that no one had seen before. And for someone that you would think was pathetic, you would do that. You would sacrifice for their good, not yours, out of love. Well, that's what we see happen. Let's turn to our text today in John chapter 3. And I want to read verses 11 through 21. So we get the whole picture here. This is, of course, the encounter that Jesus has with Nicodemus that night when when. Jesus talks about the new birth, and he talks about how uh, you can enter the kingdom of God in this new and living way. And then the story picks up here in verse 11. Very truly, I tell you, 
Jesus says, we speak of what we know and we testify to you uh, what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So Jesus is essentially emphasizing the point that I'm the only one who can give you a message from heaven because I'm the only one here that's been there. That's where I came from. Nobody's been able to go up into heaven and come back with any information, which is really interesting when you consider the near-death experience reports that a lot of people have. But Jesus says, I come from there. I come from there, and I have a message for you from heaven. Verse, 13, uh, verse 14, rather, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You might have noticed in there that famous verse, John 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. And that's what we're looking at today, God's amazing love. Now, the first thing we want to notice in this text is that Jesus assures Nicodemus that he knows what he's talking about, right? That he has this message from heaven. He can be trusted to deliver this message, and we can trust in it. And so when he's talking about being born of the water and the spirit, he says, this is earthly stuff uh, about being born of your mother and, and, and those kind of things. But I'm bringing to you a spiritual message, a heavenly message, and because of that, we can trust him, the source of that message. So Jesus brings this new idea of a new birth, uh, entering the kingdom not through the flesh or the, the ancestral ties to Abraham per se, but through faith and through that birth that comes from above. Then in verses 14 and 15, Jesus foretells his death. He explains that he's going to die. So our first point today is going to explain that Jesus is talking about his death. He's presenting it to Nicodemus. And he does this on a number of occasions to his disciples, to the 12, and to, to even audiences sometimes. He'll say, uh, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to die. And it seems like every time he says this, it just goes completely over their heads. They're like, uh, what? What was that? Did he say something about not? Yeah over and over again. And then when he finally is arrested and taken uh, to be tried and then crucified, they're shocked, even though Jesus has said over and over again, this is what's going to happen. And here you have an example of Jesus foretelling, explaining that he must die. And the reference here is to the time in Israel's history when they're wandering in the wilderness and um, they are disobeying God. And so God sends the Bible says fiery serpents. Now, I tell you what, I'm like Indiana Jones. I don't like snakes, okay? But fiery snakes, come on, right? That's a little over the top. In Numbers chapter 21, there in verse 1, it says, when the Canaanite, uh, the king of uh, Arad, who lived in Negev, heard that Israel was coming by uh, way of uh, Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. Then Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed give this people into our hands, then will we utterly destroy their towns. And he listened to the voice of Israel and handed over the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them in their towns so that the place was called Hormah. From Mount Hor, they set out to the way uh, out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. 
Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it up on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. So this is the illusion that that Jesus makes to foretell his death. He says, just as the serpent was lifted up by Moses and people were saved, they didn't die from the poison of the snakes. The son of man must be lifted up here in verse 15. And and what do they receive? Do they they receive uh, revived health in this life? Not necessarily that, but they receive eternal life, eternal life. So this is what happens. Now, what's interesting in the Israel's history is that later on, hundreds of years later, after this incident, in Hezekiah chapter, or, or, or rather 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, King Hezekiah, um, he is restoring the worship of Israel. And, and part of his restoration is to tear down all the altars and high places that were dedicated to idol worship. And as he's doing this, he finds that the bronze serpent that Moses had made to relieve the people of this, uh, this blight of poisonous snakes, he finds that it hit too had been lifted up and worshipped as an idol. And so the text there in, in 2 Kings tells us that Hezekiah, the reformer, he takes that bronze serpent and he breaks it into pieces. And he calls it Nehushtan. You know what Nehushtan means? means a piece of bronze. He realized what so many people who worship idols fail to realize. The idol is nothing. It's just a piece of bronze. It was just a piece of bronze when Moses lifted it up. What made it effective is the people trusting God to do what he told them to do when they needed help, when they needed salvation. And that continues even though that old piece of bronze was broken up by Hezekiah years and years ago. Well, Jesus foretells his death and he's done this on a number of occasions. Um, but we find that there's going to come a time when Jesus comes again, but not to deal with sin and not uh, to die. He came the first time to die, but he's going to come again. And the second time he comes, it's not going to be for, for death. In Hebrews chapter 9, there in verses 27 and 28, there we go. <laughs> uh, the Bible says, uh, just as is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to hear, to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So this first advent of Christ is to deal with sin. And the way he does that is somehow similar to the way that Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness. He's going to be lifted up. And of course, we know that he was lifted up on a cross. We see the, the people looking to the serpent for salvation. And we know that those who look to Jesus for salvation for eternal life, not just earthly life, but eternal life will find it in him. Now, one of the things that I think is probably analogous here is the fact that God's way of salvation is never the way we would expect it to be. If you had asked me or maybe some other human being, what would be a good way for God to save people eternally? Well, we might come up with a very different plan. It would probably go like this. Step one, and then step two, And usually there's a third step in a poem somewhere in there. But we would come up with a system, right? We'd come up with a a self-help, personal growth plan. You'd get your life coach in there, and he would help you figure out what you need to do to improve. And eventually you can get to the point where maybe you can be saved. Well, 
God's way of salvation is counterintuitive to anything people had thought of before. And it's much more like what Moses did in the wilderness. Nobody would have come up with the idea that Moses had in the wilderness to make this bronze serpent and hold it up. And if you get bit by a snake, find that bronze serpent, look at it, and you'll be all right. It sounds crazy, right? Almost as crazy as trusting in a crucified Savior. Can you imagine the reaction that so many people had in Jesus' day to the idea that that he would give them life, that he was the true king, that he would save us? And the first thing people would think, well, didn't he die? Wasn't he on the losing end? How can he be a savior. In fact, this was the challenge. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, there in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. Now, If you have like a King James Version or another translation, it might say the foolishness of preaching. And no doubt there's a a certain foolishness to preaching, right? You hear it every Sunday. It's a little foolish, the whole thing of of getting up here and talking for an hour, right? Uh, But that's not what Paul's talking about per se, the method of communication. He's really saying it's the, the content of the preaching, or as it says here in the New Revised Standard, the proclamation itself. It was considered to be foolishness. If you go down to verse 22, it says that uh, uh, it's, a, it's a stumbling block for the Jews, verse 23, and it's, it's foolishness to the Gentiles. The word foolishness, it's the word scandalos in the Greek. We get our word scandal from. It's like scandalous. Like, you believe in a crucified Savior? It would have been scandalizing to people. They couldn't hardly buy into such a ridiculous notion. And yet, that was God's plan. And it pleased God that people would never come up with this idea. It pleased him. Because then, guess what? God gets all the glory. Right? God's glorified in our salvation because it's not a scheme of man. It's not something that you or I have come up with. It's all of God. So often we are like those who have a way in mind that we think is right. In Proverbs 14, verse 12, the scripture says, there is a way, there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. You know, a lot of times we can fool ourselves into thinking we're pretty good people. In fact, we can start to think we're not just pretty good. We're we're really good. In fact, we sometimes start thinking, you know what? I'm the best. I am amazing. And a lot of people will run headlong into disaster thinking, I have got this. But they don't. Now, Christianity provides us a mirror. And we look into Christianity and we see ourselves for who we really are, or we see ourselves as God sees us. And we realize, oh, I'm not as amazing as I thought I was. In fact, I'm kind of messed up. I'm kind of broken. And I need a lot of help. In fact, I need a savior. That kind of thinking is very hard for many people to accept because pride and selfishness and self-centeredness gets in the way of even hearing the good news of the gospel because it's not the way that we want to be saved. It's not the way that we want to see how it would go. But there is a way that seems right. And the end thereof is destruction. Well, Jesus... His way of salvation through the cross is similar to that serpent in the Moses and that nobody would have thought of it. It's all God's plan. It's also similar in the sense that that it's the only salvation. If you were in the camp of Israel when those serpents were biting people, 
If you didn't go to that serpent, you were as good as dead. If you didn't go find the one that Moses had fashioned and, and put up on that pole and make sure you fixed your eyes on it, trusting that that would somehow save you through God's power, you were as good as dead. There was no other salvation. And that's the same with Jesus. Jesus says in Acts chapter 4, there in verses 11 and 12, he says that the stone that was rejected by the builders, it has become the cornerstone. And then he says in verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now Peter, when he says these words, he's not being figurative. He's not trying to uh, use fancy language. He, Peter's a fisherman. He's just telling you like it is. There's no other salvation outside of the name of Jesus. And Jesus said this himself in John chapter 14, there in verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so while the salvation under Moses and the, the sense of, of surviving the blight of poisonous snakes, uh, that was one way that you could be saved under Christ. There's one way to be saved. Moses' salvation was from physical death, but the salvation with Christ is from spiritual death, eternal death. Neither remedy was forced upon anyone. Neither remedy was forced. Can you imagine anyone? There, might, there had to be at least one. You know, there's always one. There had to be one person in the camp who heard Moses say, all you got to do if you get bit by the snake is come find the bronze snake on a pole and fix your eyes on it and you'll be good to go. And they thought, that's ridiculous. I am not going to go look at that bronze serpent if I get bit by a snake. That's, that's crazy. What do you think happened to that guy? Well, he was free to do that, I suppose. And there's many people today that hear about the salvation in Christ and they reject it wholesale. Don't even want to consider it. And that's, they're free, free to do that as well. We've got to trust that the eternal life, there it says in verse 15, the eternal life is available to us because the Son of Man will be lifted up just like that serpent was. Well, now when we get to verse 16, we see that the motivation, the motivation for this gift is love. So the second point of our sermon today is that uh, God is going to give this wonderful gift of salvation out of love. Now the reason that God has to do this, of course, is because of sin. It's because of sin. In Romans 6, verse 23, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So because we've got that mirror now and we see ourselves the way God sees us, we're sinners, we're lost, we're as good as dead, just like those folks who had been bitten by snakes in the wilderness we realize we need a savior. And so does God. So does God. He realizes that we need a savior. He realizes that we cannot save ourselves. And so he has compassion on us and he loves. Now the key word here, love is a verb. It's an action. God so loved that he gave. When people tell you they love you, but then they don't act like they love you, do you really think they love you? No. Because love is a verb. It has to be realized in action. And that's what we see here in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God loved us even when we were still sinners. Right? He goes on in that passage to talk about, you know, it's, it's, it's not a big deal if you love somebody who loves you back. 
It might even be commendable if you love somebody who's an honest person, but you really don't care for them. But you wouldn't give your life for that person, would you? Maybe it's somebody you really cared about and you, you had an affection for and they had an affection for you, a really good person. But somebody who you don't even know, you just know they're a decent person or whatever, you're probably not going to die for them. God says that he proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know how many people I've talked to who say, I, I know I need God in my life. I know I need to turn things around. And when I get better, then I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my faith in Jesus and start living for him. But I got to deal with all these sins in my life first. I've, I've got to get over some things first. I've got a lot of hurt I've got to deal with. Or I just, I'm not quite there. I need to know some more about about the Bible, or I need to know some more theology. I know that Jesus saved me, and I want that, but I, I just need to be in a better place. That's not the way salvation works. God loved the world even when the world was at odds with God. God sent his son to die for us even while we were still sinners. And so we sing that old hymn, Just As I Am. I come, Lord. I come. I don't have to work. I don't have to improve. I don't have to somehow pass a Bible quiz. I don't have to do all these things to show that now I'm ready. I just simply have to come just as I am and let God begin making those changes for me and in me. And so you see these words here in John 3, 16, for God so loved. That word so is key because it contains the action in the manner that God loved. What did he do? He gave his son to die for us. It's absolutely amazing. And of course, later on when John would write um, his epistles, when he'd write 1 John and 2 John and 3 John, he would reflect on these ideas of God's love. In fact, a lot of Bible scholars call John the apostle of love because he talks about it so much. And John's whole theology is based on the idea that when you get right down to the root, to the bottom of it, God is love. Look at what John says in 1 John 3.16. So we talk about the gospel of John 3.16. Here's 1 John 3.16 where he writes, we know love by this that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Think about that for a minute. We know love by this. John's saying, without the example of Christ and his death and God's love in, in giving that wonderful gift, we wouldn't even know what true love was. It teaches us how to love. Then in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, John would just conclude, we love because he first loved us. If you want to have more love in your life, look to the example of Jesus, that self-sacrificial love, that agape love, and say, how can I do more of that for the people in my life? How can I will the good of the other people in my life and find ways to give and sacrifice for their good? And of course, we know that when we do that, we receive a blessing, not that we're some, like it's a transaction, we get something out of it, but what we get out of it is the joy of giving, right? We get the joy of giving. And so when you think about this verse, we've heard it so many times today and, and, and throughout history, God so loved the world. Think about it, this momentous change in our understanding of love. John would say in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then, of course, 1 John 4, verse 8, John simply says, God is love. You want more love in your life, more love in your marriage, your family, more love in your church, in your community, more love in the world, look to Jesus, look to the love of God demonstrated in the sacrifice of Christ. Now, 
The object of his love is the world. The Greek word here, cosmos, is the, the order of creation. Now, John's not saying that God so loved the material universe, per se. It's a, it's a figure of speech. It's the idea of, uh, it's a synecdoche. It's, it's referring to uh, the, the world for what's contained in the world, right? Uh, or it, I guess it's metonymy, actually. It's a form of figure of speech where the people of the world, that's who God loved, not just the material universe. God so loved the world. And where this would really hit hard is that it wasn't just the Jews, right? For God so loved the Jews would have been a message that many of the Jews in Jesus' day would have said, yeah, that's right. We've, we've been trying to tell these Gentiles that for a long time. But John comes along, he says, for God so loved the world. And not only that, he says that whosoever, whosoever believes. This is an amazing concept. Just like the fact is, as Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 7, that the sunshine and the rain, they are given to the just and the unjust. The love of God is offered and demonstrated through Christ to the whole world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, you see this amazing idea presented that, that Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Just like in the days of Moses, anybody in the camp of Israel could come and find physical salvation from that poisonous bite of the snake. It was offered to everyone. Now, Jesus says, it's offered to the whole world, this gift of eternal life provided through Christ's atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's why we go out and preach the gospel to the world. That's why we go into every nation and make disciples because the love of God reaches out to everyone. Everyone. And of course, the love of God seeks to accomplish salvation. Not perish is the word you want to hear in John 3, verse 16. Whosoever believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what salvation is about. It's about not perishing. Not experiencing that destruction that should surely come upon us because of our sins without the loving sacrifice of Christ. And then, of course, we have the response of the believer is the means of our salvation. Grace, of course, God's grace is the foundation. Love is the motivation. And the means, of course, is our faith in Christ. Whoever believes that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have everlasting Life. Now you get to verse 17 and we find something very surprising. Sometimes we read verse 16 and we, we disconnect it from the context and it's a beautiful passage. It's been on uh, signboards at, at football games and the Olympics. It's, it's posted on posters and, and billboard signs. Uh, people have embroidered it on pillows and all kinds of stuff. John 3.16. But let's look at verse 17. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Now, because many people in our world today don't have a mirror and they don't realize how far from God they are and just the dire situation they're in because of sin, we do have to remind people <laughs> that there's danger that they are in sin. We have to sometimes point out the fact that what is going on is sinful in their life and that needs to be changed and that needs to be atoned for. But Jesus did not come just simply to, to condemn the world. And the reason is the world is already condemned. Look what he says here. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He came to save, not to condemn. Now, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, 28, we know Jesus is going to come back another time, right? 
He's going to appear a second time, and that's when he's not going to be here to save people from sin, but he's going to bring judgment. He's going to bring judgment. Paul talks about this in his, his sermon on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. He says there in Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, that God had overlooked the times of ignorance when people didn't know that they were facing judgment because of their sins or they didn't know there was a way out and they were separated from God because of their sins. And so now that's changed. There's no more uh, tolerance for ignorance. Now everywhere people are called to repent. And then he says this, there's a day, there's a day appointed, a day fixed on which the world will be judged in righteousness. And it's going to be judged by Jesus, by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So John 3.16 tells us about the motivation for the gift of Christ's sacrifice. John 17 tells us that he came not to condemn, but to save. And John 3.18 says, those who believe in him are not condemned. They don't perish They're not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. When we preach the gospel, we understand it to be good news. That's what the word means, evangel. The gospel, the good news, the good proclamation. But not everybody else will receive it that way. Not everybody else will understand it that way. Because they don't recognize their sin or because they don't recognize the need for salvation, especially people who have it pretty good in this life. But what people do respond to is the amazing gift of God's love. And as we come to Advent and Christmas time, we're reminded of that gift. We're reminded of the amazing sacrifice and maybe that'll wake some people up to realize if God loved us that much, then maybe I really need to hear what this is all about. So as we think about the love of God, we can't ever distinguish or separate it from the gift of Christ's sacrifice because that is what shows us, it demonstrates. It's the example of what love truly is looks like. Let us remember that as we live for Jesus every day and let us speak those words to the world so that they can hear the good news as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift of Christ and for your love for us. That while we were sinners, you did not turn away, but you you turned toward us and gave us the, the most important gift that we can ever receive the gift of eternal life in your son, Christ Jesus. And we understand that gift cost you dearly. It cost you your only begotten son. And so we praise you and we thank you for your love that motivated you to give. We pray, Father, that today and in the days ahead that we would be motivated and compelled by this love to be like you to imitate what you did for us as we love those around us and show Christ's love to the world. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.